What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are making a video where I'm going to make you an expert on Jane Foster Thor. Now that's one of the things that I want to focus on here, right? Jane Foster has been around for a long, long time. Technically speaking, Jane Foster first appeared in Journey into Mystery number 84 in 1962 and she was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. But for the purpose of this video, we're only going to be focusing on her time as the Mighty Thor. So think of it as a character explanation isolated to a certain particular point in a character's history. Now there is also the entire story arc that we covered. You can watch it two ways. You can simply watch just the Mighty Thor coverage that we had, which focuses exclusively on Jane Foster as Thor, or you can watch the entire video series that we have, which covers Jason Aaron's entire run, and the Mighty Thor with Jane Foster was simply just a part of that. But there was an interview that Jason Aaron had done about seven years ago, where he addressed everything going on with Jane Foster when she had initially popped up and all the things that went along with it. And one of the things to know is that when Jane Foster first emerged as Thor in Marvel Comics 1, we didn't know who it was. And that's the significant thing, is Jason Aaron talked about that in saying that there were two aspects of this plan that were at work at the same time. The first is that Jane Foster becoming Thor had roots that went all the way back to the events of Thor God of Thunder. And the second is that he had always planned for this to be the case. So looking at the first one, the idea behind Jason Aaron doing this is that with Thor God of Thunder, that was the first arc. That's when he initially took up writing of Thor and blew the doors off the comics. I mean, you talk to anybody out there that's been reading Thor for any measure of time and they'll tell you Thor God of Thunder is one of the best runs on Thor there ever was and the God Butcher story arc the very first arc of that story was phenomenal I still say to this day Jason Aaron's entire run Jane Foster included is one of the absolute best Thor runs that's ever been written and probably the best Thor run that's ever been written but when this all happened the main focus of his initial run focusing on Thor himself was the idea of worthiness it was whether or not he was actually worthy to lift his own hammer and that's why if you go back and you look at all those things in God of Thunder, the emergence of Gore the God Butcher, the idea that God ignored mortal beings, the entire basis behind why Gore is who he is in the first place, it was Thor asking the question, am I really even doing good for mortal people, right? Like, am I really, am I benefiting them by simply just fighting on their behalf? Or should I actually be listening to them when they pray and things along those lines? That was Gore's whole stance. The fact that he was, he became the person he was because he lost his whole family. He realized gods existed, but gods never answered their prayers. And that as a result of that, gods don't care about mortals. And so over the course of the entirety of Thor God of Thunder, by the time you got to the end of that story, specifically going into Original Sin, Thor lost the ability to lift his own hammer. Now the events of God Butcher, or at least the initial arc, had long since passed. Gore did eventually come back, but that initial arc had long since concluded. But during Original Sin, Thor was basically told by Nick Fury that Gore was right. And that's why you kind of have to look at the story in its entirety to understand the significance of that moment. Because Thor had continually been questioning his worthiness ever since he had encountered Gore and learned to understand why Gore became the person that he was. And so when Nick Fury told him, Gore was right, you as gods really don't care about mortals, that was kind of the emotional tipping point, and that pushed Thor over the edge. He lost the ability to lift Mjolnir and ultimately ended up taking up the battle axe Jarnbjorn instead. This left Mjolnir on the surface of the moon, and somebody mysterious had reached down to pick up the hammer. Now again, we didn't know who this was in the beginning. Instead, it was just a new Thor. And that was of a huge level of intrigue for comic book fans. A lot of people really wanted to know who this person was. That was a huge source of mystery. However, at the time that this happened, when it was revealed it was a woman who had done it, you ended up seeing a lot of controversy in the comic book community. And when I say controversy, that's not the right word to use. It was a ruffling of feathers, right? It was those soft, gentle feathers of soft, gentle people being ruffled. Uh, and so the result of this is you saw people who were just kind of pissed off that a woman had become Thor, or on the other side of the equation, people were mad because they felt that Thor was not really uh, a title so much as a name. Now, the benefit of comics is it's whatever you want it to be, right? That's the beauty of it all. I mean, a lot of people said, well, no, Thor is an actual name. It's an actual person in the real world, but Marvel Comics violates the idea of how things function in the real world all the time. Nobody ever complains about that. So it's just selective outrage, right? Just choosing what they wanted to be angry about. But the thing about this is that what you saw right off the bat were things just happening quickly when it came to Jane Foster. And the reason why that matters is because at the time, she was kind of a background character. There was nothing to indicate that it was it was basically the same person. That version of Thor that had popped up had blonde hair. Jane Foster had brown hair. So there was no reason to believe that it was a situation where Jane Foster had lift the hammer of Thor. Now, there was a lot of rumor and a lot of speculation, a lot of people who were curious about it, and a lot of people correctly guessed it, right? A lot of people guessed it accurately and saying, like, it's Jane Foster. It makes the most sense. Other people had sources on the inside. 
<laughs> right, editors or other writers who worked at Marvel that Jason Aaron had talked to or who were going over the comic to make sure that it was it was edited correctly for Marvel Publishing. And they were like, I mean, just so you know, it's Jane Foster, right? So that's how the industry works. There's no secrets in the world anymore. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know, somebody else does, right? It's only a matter of time before they tell you. But the thing about this is that Jane Foster had actually been a part of the Congress of Worlds, which was basically quite literally a Congress that represented the different realms of the Asgardian mythos, right? The nine realms. Midgard or Earth was one of those. And Jane Foster was the representative of Midgard on the Congress of Worlds. Now, another major focal point of her character at the time was that she had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And so essentially it was like Jason Aaron was just writing her out, right? There was only a matter of time before she died. We didn't really have a lot of precedent to indicate that. The only one we did have was the death of Captain Marvel in uh, 1984 by Jim Starlin. And so cancer in Marvel Comics, it does exist, but it really seems to present itself as one of these things where unless you're someone like Wade Wilson with an insane healing factor, uh, cancer will ultimately kill you. It's kind of like this immutable, indestructible thing that nobody can stop. And I think that's just Marvel's way of highlighting the significance of that illness and then applying it to comics to show just how terrible of an illness it is. But again, all these different things that were going on with Jane Foster at this point in time, none of them indicated that it was Jane Foster who was Thor. And in fact, all these clues indicated that it wasn't her, right? How could a person with cancer lift the hammer of Mjolnir, which I guess is possible, but then go on to become Thor at the same time? She was basically dying. She was undergoing chemotherapy. She was incredibly weak. None of it really seemed to make any sense. But focusing on the publishing side, and in fact, one of the questions that a lot of people have is why is Jane Foster referred to as the mighty Thor. So that is as much a publishing initiative as it is a name in the comic. And the reason why is because at the time, uh, while Odin's son had lost the ability to lift his hammer, his story was still being wrapped up in his own Thor comic. And so it wouldn't make any sense for Marvel to come along and publish two comics called Thor. It just doesn't do that. Even with Spider-Man, when you had like five different Spider-Man comics going at the same time, you only had one amazing Spider-Man comic. Then you had things like Sensational Spider-Man, The Web of Spider-Man, Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, so on and so forth but they all weren't called Amazing Spider-Man because it would have been very, very difficult to keep track of all the comics themselves. And so as a result of that, when Jane Foster initially popped up, since Thor Volume 3, which had started with J. Michael Straczynski back in 2006, was still going on, what you got was simply the Mighty Thor comic. And so when the Thor Odinson comic, when Thor Volume 3 concluded, then Jane Foster's The Mighty Thor was renamed to Thor Volume 4. And then by that point, Odinson was just kind of shuffled off to Avengers and New Avengers. And the reason for that is because at that point in time, Marvel was really, really close to basically launching Secret Wars. And for those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, Secret Wars was, of course, the grand reshuffling of Marvel Comics, basically killing the multiverse, so on and so forth. And while Marvel didn't necessarily bill it that way, the evidence indicated Marvel was going to reboot, but it seemed as though they got cold feet at the last minute and ultimately didn't. But the reason why this is important is because Odin's son was part of the Avengers and New Avengers Multiversal Avengers team. And so his stories can continued on. The main Thor comics simply focused on Jane Foster. Now for her part, she was part of that to a degree, but because you already had one Thor dealing with the multiversal collapse, Jason Aaron wanted to focus on the stories of Jane Foster. And so leading into the events of Secret Wars, for that period of time, the beginning of Thor Volume 4, really running from issues 1 through 8, it dealt with a few things here and there, but that was largely building up to the post-Secret Wars landscape, the big story that Jason Aaron wanted to tell with Jane Foster. So you did see a few things that were going on with like Dario Agar, the leader of Roxxon Corporation. You saw the rise of Malekith the Accursed, who had made an alliance with the Frost Giants, which would go on to become part of the War of Realms story. We'll talk about that here in a minute. But almost immediately after Jane Foster was introduced, you basically got Secret Wars. Now, that's where the main focus of Jane Foster, or at least the, the Thor mythos, began to shift away from Odinson himself and focus on Jane. And the reason why I say that is that with the tail end of Avengers and New Avengers basically coming to a close, and and with the launch of Secret Wars issue number zero, it was the last two universes in the multiverse crashing into each other. You had the main Marvel universe, then you had the Ultimate Universe. And so what you got was Reed Richards and Black Panther and Spider-Man, Peter Parker, Miles Morales, and a few others, including Jane Foster, aboard a multiversal raft that would basically survive the collapse of the multiverse. And so when you got into Secret Wars and you essentially saw the creation or at least the formation of Battleworld by Doctor Doom, who would absorb the powers of the Beyonders, Jane Foster 
Walker was among the heroes that had survived the multiversal collapse and woke up on this world, or at least stepped out into this world from that raft. And so what you saw following that point was basically the stories of the characters branching out into their own themes. Jane Foster found herself part of the Thor Corps, which was basically the police force of God King Doom on Battleworld. But realizing that this new Battleworld was essentially the result of a combination of what was left of the multiverse merged into a singular location, that the memories of everybody on this entirety of Battleworld outside of those who survived the raft had just been modified over time by Doctor Doom to where they didn't remember what their universe was supposed to have been. As far as they were aware, things had always been this way. And so she found herself as part of the Thor Corps regarding the entirety of the Secret Wars event at the event's conclusion, facing off against a whole host of villains and different things along those lines. But what this meant is that when Secret Wars concluded that the stories of Jane Foster as Thor effectively just picked right back up where they had left off at the end of Thor Volume 4 going into Secret Wars. Now, Marvel did do your standard fare as part of all new, all different Marvel and Jane Foster so they put her on the Avengers and they showed people, hey, like this is a new character and that kind of a thing. But focusing on her own Thor comics, the truth about this is that Jason Aaron was establishing an underlying current, an underlying story. And there were actually a few of them. So the first one is that where there were some feathers that were ruffled over the result of uh, Jane Foster becoming Thor, that that was written into the book, right? Where people in the real world were like, no, Jane Foster's not Thor, Odin's son's Thor, and I won't hear otherwise, that in the comic itself, people like Odin and other Asgardians refused used to accept Jane Foster as Thor. And it was something that she routinely ran across, right? No matter what it was that she did at the end of the day, they would never see her as a Thor. Now she had of course revealed her identity to Odin's son at a point in time. And in fact, Odin's son had given her the blessing to go forward as Thor. So even with the blessing of Odin's son, nobody else would really accept it. I mean, there were a few here and there, right? There were some Asgardians who were like, I mean, she's doing good stuff, cut her some slack. But a lot of the Asgardians who were really beholden more to tradition and simply couldn't accept change, just never really wanted to accept accept her as a Thor. So again, in a lot of ways, that mirrored the real world. Another major caveat for her character was her cancer. And that was the big question that a lot of people had. If Jane Foster has breast cancer and she's basically dying, or at least undergoing chemotherapy, how does that affect her as Thor? And this was Jason Aaron's point right off the bat. As soon as he had reintroduced her or brought her in and introduced the idea of breast cancer, one of the first things he established is that whenever she changes into Thor, it basically purges her body of chemotherapy, thereby setting her back to zero. So in effect, her body's ability to heal from cancer from chemo ends up getting eradicated every time she turns into Thor, but her cancer remains. And so he'd essentially put a clock on her. It's only a matter of time before Jane Foster dies. Now, the reality here is it was really Jason Aaron taking what is in effect the overarching concept of changing characters in comics and applying it to the comic. You talk to anybody who's read comics for any measure of time and they'll always tell you everything goes back to normal for the most part, right? I mean, characters change, names change, things like that. It all goes back, right? It always goes back to the status quo, which is why I never understood why people got so upset about Jane Foster being Thor in the first place. It was never going to last forever. <laughs> uh, but the other thing that was going on is as far as the larger story arcs were concerned, that Jason Aaron was building up to something called the War of Realms. And the War of Realms was this just great story. It was a phenomenal story. It largely centered around Malekith the Accursed. And so what you had was really Jane Foster playing double duty, that on one side of the equation, she was fighting alongside the Earth superhero heroes, the Avengers, people like that against various threats. And then on the other side, you had Malekith the Accursed who was traveling around to different realms, the various realms, conquering them, subjugating them, and then, you know, expanding his own army and just going after realm after realm after realm. So it was this great big huge conflict that was out there. There were some stories that Jane Foster had where she was never really a main focus. A lot of those were crossovers. So you're looking at things like Pleasant Hill, you're looking at things like Secret Empire, all of which were great stories in their own right. I mean, don't get me wrong, they were phenomenal stories. But the question of whether or not Jane Foster would ever actually end up staying Thor for any real measure of time was definitively answered by Jason Aaron in a story called The Death of the Mighty Thor. Now, as the name suggests, this was the final story arc of Jane Foster as Thor. It was not the death of Jane Foster. It was really more just wrapping up the arc of her being Thor. And this focused largely on the Mangog. And this was a very, very particular and really an important story here because really looking beyond the publishing side and focusing more on the character of Jane, over the course of her time as Thor, again, she had constantly been trying to prove herself to the Asgardians that she was as much of a Thor as Odin's son was. But almost every step of the way, they had rejected her. But what this did is it led to the arrival of the Mangog. And instead of simply just fleeing, which was the expectation that Odin and the other Asgardians would have of her, she stood fast and went toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Mangog.
Asgard. Now, this was a monumental feat and earned Jane Foster the respect of virtually every Asgardian. And the reason for that is because, for those of you guys who don't know, the Mangog is basically an indestructible being, right? The Mangog is just this just pure force of hatred that somewhere along the line, Odin had basically been a dick to a world, <laughs> essentially led to their destruction. But in doing so, the, the, the hatred of that entire race culminated in a singular being. The Mangog has been around publishing wise in Marvel Comics for decades. And every time this guy shows up, pardon my language here, Odin shits his pants. To be quite frank with you guys, that's usually what happens, right? The Mangog is just a ridiculously powerful force of energy and is almost completely and totally impossible to kill. The best you can do is hold him off or imprison him, which is usually all, always the response of Odin whenever uh, the Mangog shows up. With Jane Foster, it was the same way, right? Jason Aaron didn't write some kind of Mary Sue story where against all odds, she pulled some level of power that Odin's never had and destroyed the Mangog. Instead, what ended up happening is she had basically grabbed Mjolnir and then threw the Mangog into the sun. And because of that, you basically had Jane Foster who had previously been told if she were to turn into uh, into Thor again, it could potentially kill her. At least she was told that by Doctor Strange. What she did is she turned into Thor one last time, defeated the Mangog, and then relented. And so in effect, it looked like Jane Foster was going to die. Now this all took place again, post all new, all different Marvel, going into uh, Marvel Legacy. And, and the reason why that matters, if for those of you guys who don't know, Marvel Legacy was just a numbering initiative. So say for example, that with Thor volume five, issue number one, that's actually Thor issue number 701. Marvel Legacy was just doing that. It was just renumbering the comics. It was entirely ceremonial. It served no real purpose whatsoever, except to confuse people. But that's why if you go and you read Jane Foster Thor, you'll see things like Thor issue number 704, which is actually where this story arc took place. But that's why you'll see that is because it's just legacy numbering is all it is. But the point behind this story is that it was Jane Foster losing the mantle of Thor, that realizing if she kept going, she would succumb to her cancer. What ended up happening is it was believed that she had died. And so Thor had tried to resurrect Jane Foster and with the help of Odin's son was basically able to pull it off. And when I say resurrect, I mean, it actually happened. Jane Foster was dead and her spirit was at the halls of Valhalla and she was gonna go in and that was gonna be the end of her. But they ended up bringing her back and she chose to come back as well. But she devoted all of her time to her chemotherapy and then convinced Thor to take his hammer and his title back. And that's how you ended up getting Odin's son going back to becoming the Thor that we all knew and that we all basically love. But for the most part, that's the story of Jane Foster as Thor. Now, there is a little bit more that goes on there, right? She ended up becoming a Valkyrie later on down the line, but that's really how all that works, right? That idea of Jane Foster Thor. Again, it's really more explaining a story arc as opposed to doing a traditional character uh, explanation where we run over like their entire publication history in a, in a more condensed way. But that's effectively what took place. But if that sounds cool to you, like I said, I have the entire Jason Aaron run. You're welcome to check it out. The Jane Foster uh, Mighty Thor run is cool, but it also fits a lot better if you focus on the entirety of the Jason Aaron run from Thor God of Thunder running all the way up until, God, what was it? It wasn't the War Thor storyline. It was uh, the final one where you had like God Thor, where Thor basically became God, Gore came back, he became a universe, like all that kind of crazy stuff. I know it sounds nuts. Believe me, it's awesome. It's a lot cooler than it may sound. <laughs> Gore does become a whole universe. It's pretty wild. But again, that's basically the gist of the character. So with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this to an end. Thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.